Welcome to the Metal Detecting Podcast, brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. We're digging the plugs and pinpointing the topics you want to hear. Now, here's your hosts, Dave Kimball and Grant Hansen. This show is brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. XP Metal Detectors is a high-end, innovative metal detector company with high-end metal detectors, coils, and pinpointers. For more information, go to xpmetaldetectors.com. For a dealer near you, try a Google search or go to xpteamusa.com. Hello and welcome to the Metal Detecting Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Kimball, coming to you from Central Oklahoma, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Grant Hanson, coming to you from New Jersey. How are you doing, Grant? I am doing well, and I hear your state is opening up a little bit quicker than New Jersey. Um, you're back to work, and uh, how's life going right now? It's going pretty good. Yeah, I started back at work Monday. Uh, school's over for the semester. My work never did stop, but I was not working because of school, So, but I am back now because of summer break um everything's opening up around here too restaurants are opening up not every restaurant but most of them uh i think some bars are opening up there's regulations here and there but yeah overall it's everything's looking pretty good yeah it's so amazing how different it is here in new jersey yeah restaurants can be open but it's got to be pickup only or delivery they're going to start in a couple of days allowing retailers to open but again it has to be curbside pickup they can't have people on the stores so um you know we've, we're actually getting a lot more cases over here we're so we're close to, so close to new york but hopefully as the weeks go by we'll be able to do more stuff oh yeah we've been we were doing the curbside thing for a while but uh now they're starting to have some dining me and the wife went out and ate some mexican food the other day and we went in and it was they had like every other table like taken mm-hmm. off and uh we sat there for a long time it was like they were understaffed or something and they had a lot of people standing out around the door waiting oh, wow. for pickup food and, and it was it was kind of crazy we we were there like way too long <laughs> oh well that stinks i guess they they're just gonna have to adjust getting back to normal life and or or the new normal right but uh speaking of new things xp team usa launched its first live broadcast on facebook this week so if you have haven't checked it out you can get it on our youtube channel where it's going to be archived so if you listen live great but if you didn't check it out on youtube right yes and also they will be going live again saturday is that right we're going to be doing a giveaway that's right may 16th going to give away the orx that's going to be an exciting one. Oh yeah that is really exciting if you don't have an orx or a deus you know get on that contest because that is a really cool machine yeah um i think whoever wins that's going to be very very happy and we'll be interested to see what they find with it you know i've been seeing a lot on facebook a lot of uh, chats about I don't, i'm gonna get a little controversial here but uh you know i see a lot of people talking lately about people lying to homeowners about fines and not telling disclosing the information that they find stuff and this and that you know and i've been reading this a couple times on a couple of groups and i guess a lot of people People, like have a lot of strong feelings towards that and i thought i'd bring it up a little bit because i want to get your opinion because my opinion i think you know the, the person the homeowner is nice enough to let you hunt on their land and everything you know and i would really definitely let them know what i found you know and i don't i'm not a for like really lying to them or disclosing information from them or whatever because most homeowners are pretty nice and let you keep everything and even if they want to keep something you know it's not worth a million dollars i mean come on this how, right. you're not gonna find something worth that much in somebody yeah yard. yeah I, I agree with you 100 percent. i mean these homeowners are gracious enough to let us on their properties i mean think about you know just a home site maybe if you're in their yard they're essentially letting you dig a bunch of holes in their grass um or if you're in their woods there you know there could be a liability about it and they're they're letting you pursue a passion and personally i've i've got a big enough personal collection where my excitement comes from recovering it and and maybe restoring it and cataloging it but 
if if the homer wants it, it's theirs. It's their land. They should uh they should have it. But like you said, a lot of them don't want the stuff, but they are interested. They want to know what you found. So right, and, you know, and one of the best things about the hobby is taking pictures of what you find. You know, and you share it on Facebook or share it somewhere else. You know, and everybody sees it, and hey, you know, get a it's pretty neat, and it comes out on your memory on face oh yeah i remember that i haven't even looked at half of the stuff that i found in so long because it's in a box somewhere you know and i think it wouldn't hurt me at all you know giving a homeowner something that i found i'll tell you this you know when i do show the homeowners what i find whether they want it or not they're so excited that it actually leads to more referrals because they tell their friends they say oh my god this guy was here he found this great stuff you should let him see what's on your property so there's there's good karma in it all right yeah, and I remember uh, I hunted with uh, KG uh, a few years back, and he was telling me about a time that he found a gold coin on some guy's uh, front yard, and he he said that hurt him the most because he had to give that back to him. <laughs> I, I can to... imagine that would hurt. It would hurt me, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it is the right thing to do. You know, and it's like I said, it, you know, even a gold coin is not worth that much. I mean, come on. <laughs> Right. I, I mean, look, if we were in this hobby to make money, we'd, we'd all be broke. We'd have no money because, you know, the, the chances of finding it and striking rich, repeatedly striking it rich, that's just not there. Yeah, so we got a great guest today. Uh, today we talked to a guy named Steve Arnold. This is the meteorite man from Discovery Channel and the Science Channel. So he also got a YouTube channel called Fireball Steve. And this guy is sounds very interesting. I can't wait to talk to him. Yeah, I used to watch his show when it was on the air. And it's, you know, it's treasure hunting, right? These guys are out there. They're doing different types of research, but they've got metal detectors and other equipment looking for meteorites. And I'll tell you, it's something I really want to pursue. So I'm really interested to talking to Steve tonight and hear what he has to say. Yes, yes. I was. I got a couple places in mind too, and I really want to try this out. And I'm, I'm going to start watching his YouTube channels, and I'm going to try to learn a little bit more about it because I am very interested. Yeah, we'll talk to him about his YouTube channels. It seems very um, educational. So if it's something you wanted to do as hunt meteorites, that's probably the perfect place to start. So when we come back, we'll talk with Steve Arnold. This is Michael from XP Metal Detectors Americas. Be sure to check out the new XP ORX Metal Detector, model starting at $649. This segment is brought to you by Omega Mill Pouches, the official digging pouch of XP Team USA. If you're looking for a rugged, hunt-tested, washable pouch, look no further than Omega Mill. Get on eBay and search Omega Mill Pouches. That's O M E G. A-M-I-L-L. We'd like to welcome a fascinating guest to the show. He is a special kind of treasure hunter. This treasure hunter searches for meteorites. He co-stars on the show Meteorite Man on the Science Channel and now has his own informational series on YouTube called Fireball Steve. Let's give a warm welcome to Steve Arnold. How you doing, Steve? Doing great. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to our show. Um, first off, are you doing okay? Are you are you faring well through this COVID nineteen pandemic? I am doing pretty decent. Um, I I juggle two careers. I have the meteorite business uh, that I've been doing for close to three decades now. Also, um, have a ghost tour business in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And our little town is 100% tourism. So we're not quite as bad as in the Caribbean where, you know, they rely on cruise ships to bring them people and money. Um, people can, and they do drive to us. Nobody flies to our town. So, um, but as you can imagine, this has just zapped our town. And so it's given me a little more time uh, to do. And our, our state has been one of the better states as far as um, the numbers are low and, and they're going down now. I think we're one of the 
the three states in America that things are going, you know, significantly better for. So, and we were never on a total lockdown, which I know will make everyone hate me and jealous <laughs> because uh, we did have the freedom to, you know, we, we were not uh, on a stay at home order. So, um, it, but, you know, everybody else around us was, so, and nobody wanted to come to town uh, because they well, maybe they wanted to, but you know, they didn't really want to come and get sick. So anyway, um, so it's, it, I, I know everybody has a different story. And, uh, for me, it's a little frustrating because, uh, there's been a couple of fireballs, um, uh, during this national lockdown and I can't get out. I can't oh, go man. chase them. Wow. Yeah. So speaking of, uh, meteorites, so can you let everybody know what exactly the difference is between meteor and meteorite and all the other variations that most don't know? Well, um, I have my my second video in my YouTube series. How's this for a plug? Um, is it's all on the terminology. It's like eight minutes of terms uh, because there is a big difference. There's meteors, there's meteorites, there's meteoroids, there's asteroids. Um, and, and it all kind of blurs together, but in space, you have a, uh, something little is called a meteoroid and that's, um, a, a yard, a meter across or smaller. Um, uh, if it's bigger than that, it's called an asteroid in space. And if it's bigger than an asteroid, it's a planetoid, um, which is what, uh, Pluto was demoted to. And then if it's bigger than that, it's a planet. So, um, and, and so most of the time, uh, they are meteoroids. Every once in a while we do get an asteroid that does come in uh, and occasionally a comet or a debris from a comet will, will hit our atmosphere. When the meteoroid, uh, hits our atmosphere, uh, the light, uh, phenomenon, the luminescence of the oxygen burning in the air as the friction of the rock uh, going through creates the light phenomenon that is called the meteor or the meteor and when the rock hits the ground it become if it survives it becomes a meteorite gotcha so when we look up into the sky and see a shooting star is that a meteor and is it a bunch of shooting stars that make up a meteor shower Um, yeah, technically your terminology is correct there. Although, um, it, it, it is, those are meteors and, um, they are usually icy, muddy ice leftovers from a comet. If, especially if it's under a second long, um, the phenomenon can be, um, it can be a rock. Um, it could be, like I said, a piece of ice from a comet if it's short. It could be a piece of space junk, especially if the fireball lasts for more than 10 seconds. Um, satellite debris that comes back in um, usually is at a very shallow angle and it's slower. And so it, it and it's usually very resistant to 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 burning up and that's a relative term because it doesn't you know it a a big chunk of metal ablates away maybe in 10 or 15 seconds and and in my business uh that that those are important um designations if you're just out you know um walking you know with your significant on a you know clear evening and you see something and you go, wow, then it's special no matter what it is, I guess. Um, but it, if you're trying to go, oh, is this something that's worth chasing? Is there something on the ground that could be picked up? Um, then you have to start uh, sorting out. And we have other videos in our series online that goes into that as well. So, yeah, um, so, so you're, you, you have to kind of decide, okay, was this too small to leave anything? Uh, was it, was it too big or too slow? Meaning it, you know, would have been a, uh, a, um, a piece of man-made junk that came back in. Um, and then in some cases, the, the rocks are actually too big. And when they hit, they, they shatter into thousands of pieces. And then those little pieces uh, uh, melt away. In, in just a fraction of a second. So uh, it is possible for a rock to be too big to survive. So a little Goldilocks, something you got to want to find something that's just right. Mm-hmm. 
that is kind of scary to think about with all this falling debris like all over the place you know <laughs> so yeah. what was your first meteorite that you found and, and is this what you ignited your passion yeah um gee whiz it's it seems like a life ago and i guess in a way it was uh i had picked up um the the <sighs> It was the title of like how to how to treasure hunt. So it was by Charles Garrett years ago, uh, 27, 28 years ago. And uh, it talked about like the 15, 15 chapters. Each chapter was talking about different ways to hunt. And um, and uh, I like the idea of going after the buried caches, the, the stuff that's hidden on farms, that kind of thing. And grew up in Kansas, was living in Oklahoma at the time. A lot, a lot of farms around, right? And so um, I was doing research on where to hunt. I ran across an old story um, in a newspaper um, from the 1880s where a lady in Kansas had found a meteorite and, and had sold it to what's now the University of Kansas. And I kind of went, whoa, wait a minute, uh, sold for money? <laughs> Back in the 1800s, if these things were worth money back in the 1800s, I probably are worth money now. And I, I think they have metal in them, don't they? And I did a, well, I went, went, it was at the historical library in Topeka, uh, which was in the same building. And then across the hall was the normal library, went over to look up meteorites. And sure enough, uh, they are worth money. Sure enough, they do have metal in them. And the metal detector can oftentimes detect them and it was like whoa they even have maps because of the scientific nature of this of, of where they fell and they would normally break up into multiple pieces so, so you, i would i was looking there that first day at, at books with maps with like 25 x's and you're going there's got to be a 26 one somewhere on this map that hasn't been found yet you know and uh so i was primed to do the research and you know and 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 but I, at the time, I didn't even own a metal detector, so I was I was doing my research before I even, you know, because I didn't know what tool I wanted to get, and so I real quickly got pulled over into this, and uh, I started finding meteorites and selling them, and you know, making money, and I was like, you know, why should I go get a real job? This is too much fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that's the dream for for most of us to to treasure hunt for a living. Um, how do, how do you know the difference between a meteorite and just a rock? There, there's a couple different ways to tell. And basically, there, there's the, the field evaluation versus the scientific evaluation. If you're, if you're out in the field, do you want to bend over and pick something up? Um, and then do you want to drag it home with you? And what you're looking for is um, if it's a freshly fallen rock, it's going to be black. It's, it's going to have a crust, a fusion crust from the melting of the fireball when it came in. You have a rock that typically 95% to 99% of the rock will ablate away. So if it starts out as 100 pounds, it may end up as, you know, three or four pounds. And it may break up into 20 pieces, little pieces. So um, each of those pieces will have crust on it um, if it broke up in flight inside the fireball. And uh, they'll get they'll all get melted over. And then sometimes they break um, or they break after they leave the fireball. And so they're not always 100% covered in crust. Sometimes they'll be half because it broke in half on the way falling or it hit the ground and bounced and broke, whatever. So you're looking for a rock that has a black crust. If it's been on Earth for a little bit of time, that crust will start to go brown and rusty. And if it's been on the Earth for quite some time, uh, it'll end up, it'll almost, it'll look like um, rust. It, like a hammer or nails that have been left out in the rain, a sledgehammer, that that color of rust, that orangey color is what bleeds out in the rock. And most meteorites are stone type. They'll have some metal in them. Now, oftentimes people think of meteorites as the big chunks of metal that, you know, are at the big museums. And those are pretty rare. They're, they're only about 2% of meteorites are are all metal like that. Now, when I say 2%, there's some of the largest ones tend to be the irons and they, they melt away a lot slower, more survive 
and the really big one. Almost all of our cratering, the the big ones that make the big holes in the ground are are from the iron. So there tends to be more pieces of those, even though they're fewer in number. So two percent of what you see in the sky flying over is metal. Ninety eight percent is going to be stone. Uh, and and so that's usually what you're looking for is a, is a rock. It's a little heavier, um, maybe half again as heavy as the other rocks around. Uh, a magnet should stick to most of them. Not all. Five percent don't have metal in them. Um, but um, more often than not, you're looking for something that's different. And if you're in an area where others have been found, you again, go find a picture of the ones that have been found there and look for something that looks like it because, you know, something else would have, you know, would would have same material, same environment, same weathering, whatever. Um, if it's a fresh fall and something's been found, look look for it. There's, the, there's, there's little telltale personalities with rocks that will often be very – not, not unique, but but you'll look at this and go, oh yeah, this looks just like a park forest one, and and it's a little different than any of the other ones, and it's uh, you know it's it's like anything, you know you know a button, a Civil War button, you know people who know their buttons, they can look at it and tell you what it is. It's the same mm-hmm. with meteorites. So right. The more you deal with them, the more you know about it. So is this how you can tell, uh, or how you can identify how it, its its particular source or particular type or where it even came from? So. So there is a a element or a, a group in within meteoritics that's more on the scientific side. There are the researchers, there are the museum curators, there are the uh, in, you know colleges that that will teach this stuff, and they do research on it. And um, there's a few researchers that go out and hunt. There's a few hunters that really know their science stuff. Um, I'm a little more on the, the, the hunting side, and I just kind of take by faith what they say. Um, when you find something new, uh, the, the trade-off is you donate a little piece to science, and there are several institutions around the globe that will – uh, they will accept a donation from you of the rock, 20 grams worth typically. If it's a really small one, uh, if it's only a 20 gram rock, they only need 2% to, to qualify um, as a repository sample. And in exchange for that donation, you get um, a very, very thir- thorough uh, peer reviewed um, uh, classification as to what type it is. And then there's an official name that's assigned to it, which helps within the scientific world. You know, so all all the papers that are published into the future, they use the same name, um, and it it avoids confusion that way. Instead of Steve's Rock, you know, or or you know the Eiffel Tower Rock, you know, no, it's, it's would you know it would be. Paris. <laughs> if, if I, if Steve found uh, a rock in Paris at the Eiffel Tower, it would. Now they might actually call it the Eiffel Tower, it, but if it, if that's the official name, then that's what would stay with it forever. And, gotcha. uh, so, uh, the, and there are some quite a bit of nuances. Um, typically, they like to um, uh, group them by planet, uh, by parent bodies, I should say. And so if something came from the moon and we have about 200 meteorites, uh, that are known from the moon, uh, now, uh, uh cratering events, you look at the moon, it's full of craters, asteroid or a comet hits the moon, blasts out a crater. Some of the rocks are flung out of the hole in the ground and they escape the gravity of the moon, and they make their way to Earth. Same thing happens with Mars. And then there are different asteroids. There's a couple we know. Um, Vesta is one that we have about 5% of our meteorites come from Vesta. Um, the, uh, there's other parent bodies that no longer exist as a big parent body, they got bl- blasted to smithereens, you know, a billion or two billion years ago. And their remnants are floating around and they still make it to Earth. And so uh, scientists like to group them by the parent body, whether it's known or not. 
uh, whether it currently exists or not. And then different parent bodies will have different um, um, alterations. So, so sometimes there's a wide variety of different rocks that come from different parent bodies. Gotcha. Very interesting and so much to know. Um, you mentioned earlier that, hey, you can make money off of these things. Um, what makes some meteorites more valuable than others? Meteorites are just rock, and they're, there's this fine line between um, worthless and, and priceless, um, and there's, they usually fall somewhere between worthless and priceless. Um, the value in a meteorite, the real value is the information it contains. And science is able to glean quite a bit of information from a rock or from a piece of a rock. And um, as science um, evolves and gets smarter, scientists learn new things. They uh, equipment um, research techniques over time get better. So um, a meteorite might hold information that won't be revealed for another hundred years. So someone pulls it off the off of the shelf and goes back and studies it with new technology. Um, uh, but, but having said that, there's, there's a base amount of information that can be acquired early. And so they, like there was a rock, um, it was in 1998 that fell in Monahans, Texas. There were seven boys playing basketball after school, and this rock landed a couple feet beside them. And um, this particular rock had something in it that had never been seen before, and it, it had a blue purple crystals inside it that turned out to be salt, halite. And um, it, it, it was like, this is weird. Um, and no one had seen that before. And NASA got a hold of it and did some. Well, it you, salt comes from water, and so it's like okay, there was water on this asteroid to form the salt that got captured in here. So um, that was a new piece of information. And so um, that's the real value. Having said that, like anything else, there are collectors, and there are. in and, and it's the same way with any treasure hunting. Whether you're hunting for bottles or or uh, diamond necklaces or uh, um, cannonballs or whatever, um, there are little groups of people out there that will pay money for thing. And, um, and then it, it gets to supply and demand. Then, you know, if there's a lot of something, um, then uh, it the, the tends to be priced lower. Um, if there's not very much of it, or if there's a big demand, uh, if, if a, a fireball flies over Detroit, uh, and, and, uh, and it happened a couple years ago and, um, there were 25 rocks or something found up there in, in Michigan. And, um, but very, very little made it out onto the market. I made a trade with a guy, uh, with one of the meteorites I found on TV on one of my, um, you know, the, the meteorite in episodes and we did a swap and, and I, and I just got, a, uh, it wasn't even two grams of this rock, a dust, little particles. His two year old kid found it on a frozen lake. So he was a meteorite hunter. He got his wife and kid and packed him in the car and it's icy and it's cold up there. And we're walking around on the lake and they start screaming and I walk over and they were all excited. The two-year-old found the rock, walked up to it, you know, and it's like, um, so, but it, when it hit the ice, it broke into a couple pieces and some little crumbs. And so we, he picked up the pieces and the little crumbs and afterwards it was like, you know, well, Hey, Hey, do you want to sell any of this? No, I want to, you know, he was a collector. He, this was his dream to go find mm -hmm. the rock. I was like, all right, well, if you ever want to, or if you want to, you know, sell some little pieces, or if you want to trade for something, Ooh, I might trade, you know? And so we made this deal and I got a, a couple grams, not even two grams and, and came home. And, and I put little tiny pieces like, like 10 milligram pieces and on eBay and they started selling for like 50 bucks a piece. <laughs> so it's like five thousand dollars a gram this rock is maybe worth a hundred bucks a gram all right mm. but none of it was on the market and none of it was in little piece and so i put it up 
And, and I got it up right before Valentine's Day. And there were hundreds and thousands of people walking out on Friday afternoon in Detroit with their lovers and the fireball went over and for 50 bucks to get an awesome piece of this rock sold, 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 sold. And I ended up selling it all off for this crazy amount. And um, so was it worth 50? Was it worth 5,000 a gram? No. Was it worth $50 each little crumb? Yeah. Why? Because there was an emotional connection to a lot of people. Okay. So it, that's a, it's a freaky thing. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's like anything else that's supply and demand. Um, there's, there's a, uh, you know, usually there's the small group of collectors and, um, and they kind of fight over stuff and, um, the stuff that, and then some things are, are really cheap, um, because there's a lot of it, but it, it costs money and time to go find them. And so that, you know, the people are going, I'm not going to sell it. You know, it, it, it took me, it took me three hours to find this one. I'm not selling it for 10 cents. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you want it, if you want it, you got to pay 30 bucks. And, you know, and a lot of times people are going, I'm not going to pay 30 bucks for that. And so it sits there. And then one day, you know, someone will go, oh, okay, I'll give you 30 bucks for it. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah I go, okay. I got, my, I got my three hours out of it. Thanks. Deal. So um, yeah. there's that long answer to what makes them worth. You know, it's crazy people uh, uh, that are willing to spend <laughs> money on <laughs> junk, <laughs> space junk. We'll be right back with the meteorite man, Steve Arnold. Hi, this is Dave D. Hi, this is Sonia. R.C. Dunn. This is Alan. Yep. We're the Minnesota Beach Boys. This is Kendall. This is David Kimball. This is Grant Hanson. D. Center. Lynn Quellen. Hi, this is John. Josh Kimmel. Cameron Macer. Pete Sorrell. And we are. And we are. And we are XP Team USA. And you are listening to the Metal Detecting Podcast. If you are looking for more information about XP products such as dealers or updates, then check out MetalDetectorsAmericas.com. Hello, this is Daniel from XP Metal Detectors Americas, and I just wanted to let you know about the XP Metal Detectors Americas.com website, which is full of information on the Aeus Metal Detector and the ORX Metal Detector. Both are wireless and do all aspects of metal detecting, which is gold processing, coins, jewelry, and relics. And we're back with Fireball Steve Arnold. So what kind of tips would you give to a beginner who is interested in searching out for these uh, rocks? There are a couple ways you can hunt. You can chase fireballs. Um, You can go to places where others have been found. And uh, you can go to new places where none have been found, but the terrain is favorable for spotting cold finds and um, th- that's the three main ways um, and they're all different skill sets um, fireballs have have their own unique uh, way and and basically and and that is what my my new online series that is in the process of going up right now I think we're gonna load uh, episode number four today um, and I think we're gonna have nine or ten episodes when when we get done uh, with the uh, post-production on those it's it's a it's a one hour crash course for people to binge watch to learn everything they need to know to go out today and or tomorrow and find a meteorite that just landed near them so if you saw a fireball um and you want to go find a piece uh this takes you through the step what was it a meteorite or a meteoroid uh did it produce likely produce rocks and if so where did they land and then what are you looking for and then how do you look for it and then once you find it you want to sell it how you get everything you need to know in an hour Mm. it's free and it's on youtube and and um, to help people that mm. the problem with fireballs is you never know when they're going to happen and uh, we know they period they it's, it's basically there's um about 25 of them that will land in the united states per um year so about every two weeks so sometimes we'll have two in one day and sometimes we'll go a month without one um and i mean every day there's something coming in but i mean something big enough where people 
enough people see it and there's a good chance there's something on the ground. Um, and then, of course, a, a, a big chunk of those, if they, they land in the water or they land in super mountainous route, um, terrain or on you know, a military base or you know, whatever, it, it's, it's just because something landed doesn't mean you can get to it. Um, that's its own skill set, and um, so I would send people there. If you want to uh, go to a place where others have been found, do research in your area. Um, or where you want to travel to. And uh, there's some online sources. There's a, a, a database, um, just meteorite database. Google it. It'll take you over to the funny URL. And um, you, can, you can pull up all the meteorites found in Colorado, for example, if you're there. Uh, sometimes there are books published uh, for all the meteorites found in Colorado. Uh, go buy the book uh, and, and learn about the places. And then, you know, sometimes there, there was just one rock. There's, it's almost, it, it's hard to guess, but, but I mean, there's, there's a good chance. There's probably, I'm going to guess 80% chance that a meteorite when it comes in will break up into more than one piece of And so um, if one lands, there's odds are pretty good. There's another one within a mile of where that one was found. So if you know where that one was found, then you can go hunt that way. Um, if, it, if it was an old find that was plowed up by a farmer in 1942, okay, where's the farm? Where, uh, where was the rock found? Uh, is, there, is there any publication on it telling about, or was there a story written in the newspaper about it? Because oftentimes when something would come to light, they would inform the other they would do a newspaper story on a press release. They'd let the neighbors know, keep your eyes out for other pieces. Um, and, you know, now, of course, if, if it's a place where 300 pieces were found, your odds of uh, a 301st one waiting for you is a little higher than if just one was found. Hmm. Um, and so a lot like anything else, like gold nuggets, you know, you have a lot better chance finding Civil War artifacts if you're near a Civil War battle. Or right. mm-hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, that's true. Doesn't, doesn't mean a belt buckle didn't fall off, you know, on, on a trail somewhere way away from a campsite or you know, sure. But, you know, do, do you go just out in any pasture in Montana and look for a Civil War belt buckle? No. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's kind of that way. Um, then the third way is to go to places where it's easy to spot meteorites and and that would be deserted areas uh dry lake beds when you get out in the west area is really good um uh, areas um so obviously some uh, deserts are are more floral you know more cactus more stuff bad terrain um than others uh the best place on the planet right now is the atacama desert in chile uh, you can go and look at, uh, so, so the meteorite man, uh, television episodes are not on the, uh, television anymore, but we're hoping that Netflix or someone will pick them up, but it's nothing's been with our production company. No, no deals been made, but you can get the slightly blurrier versions on YouTube. And um, <laughs> there are two, uh, two episodes from a chili that really exemplify why ch- and and one of the episodes I, I found a cold find just sitting there on top of the ground and that desert down there is there's parts of it that is 40 million years old wow. so if a meteorite landed there 40 wow. million years ago it is still sitting there it's a dry mm. desert and it's and so you have all that time of accumulation, you get you go you go back ten thousand years and go to New England. Uh, there was a, a mile of ice on top of the ground. All right, so if finding something in New England, you have less than ten thousand years of accumulation versus forty million. Where would you rather hunt? Right. Right. Um, and 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 so uh, there there are some places that are just easier to see. Antarctica is really great, you know, because they've got the ice dome down there that rocks fall on, and kind of a conveyor belt moves them along. And so, um, 
Yeah. Like, like See, anything else, but there, there are so a fireball can land anywhere, um, and and they in and over time they do. So there are meteorites everywhere. Everyone that's listening, there's a meteorite within a mile of you. Well, but, <laughs> I think but, we're all gonna yeah. But <laughs> trying to find it can be tough, and you know, and and if you're up if you're up north and there's glaciers, then it, yeah, it, it can be you know fifty feet below you. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um, b- but within a mile, right? So, um, and then obviously there's some areas that are just a little more easy. So, uh, and, and, and fireballs, and th- there's this misinformation out there about craters. Like, and, and that's one of the real big thing on fireballs is that there's an optical illusion. People swear it, it landed just on the other side of the barn. And it literally could have landed 200 miles away. And you cannot tell. And, and I mean, you really, really, really believe it's just right over that hill or on the other side of the tree or the barn. And it's not. Um, they burn out five to ten miles up. So if it landed like within a mile of you, it burned out right above you five to ten miles up. Mm. Not, not down. So I like to tell people, you know, you, it's, it's like standing under a tree looking at the full moon. It, it looks like the moon is caught in the branches of the tree. It, you, your eye, it yeah. really looks like it, but it's not. It's a little farther away, right? Mm-hmm. Same way with the fireball. And so um, th- that's a real big part. That's a big part in my, my training is, is just don't, don't trust your eyes. Don't, don't. Um, your eyes are good for one direction. You have to get a, a video or someone else's accurate um, eyewitness from another angle to be able to triangulate things. Um, they usually also produce, um, if, if a rock makes it to the ground, there'll be a sonic boom or sometimes multiple sonic booms. And, um, and there's never a crater. They don't hit the ground on fire. There's not burning grass around. Um, there's hoaxes and, and that, that pop up online every year. You know, you know, there'll be this hole in the ground and it's smoking. And it's like, no, someone poured gasoline down a gopher hole and caught it on fire. This is not a meteorite that landed there. <laughs> Cratering events only happen like once every 500 years on planet Earth. They're very rare. The, the huge thing that exploded over Russia in 2013, the Chelyabinsk one, you know, that got on on the dash cams, that didn't make a crater. Mm. It burned out five miles up and it dropped a rock. The, the big rock landed in a lake, popped a hole in the lake. Uh. And so, um, you know, had it landed on the ground, it, it would have made an impact pit. It you know, would have punched a hole, but it would not have blasted out a crater. Those, those are extremely rare. And um, you're, it's probably not going to happen in our lifetime. Maybe, maybe if we get kind of lucky, although probably unlucky for the people nearby, but so that's, that's Hollywood, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and of course over billions of years, yeah, you, the moon's full of craters. We got a lot of craters on earth too, but you know, um, no, don't, don't go looking for craters. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I'm lucky enough to find a meteorite, is there anything I should do? Should I report it? How should I store it? Well, that's a good question. Um, and there's not really a right or wrong answer. Um, most meteorites that are found are not super valuable to science. Um, and if one is found, there's usually more around. So if you find the rock and no one else knows about it, it's your, it's your little treasure. You know, you found a gold nugget. Ooh, there's one. There's probably more. Let's keep it quiet and sneak out here and hunt for more, right? Oh, you found five $20 gold pieces. Uh, there's maybe a six. Let's keep it quiet. Let's sneak out here, right? Um, if, you, if you're curious and you want to know what type it is, um, you can get a rough guess by looking at it and show it to someone, do your research. But it probably requires going to a lab. And, and if you want to get it officially classified, then you need to donate a part of it. Um, some people find meteorites and they don't, they don't care. They, they, they just put it on their shelf and they leave it there. And, you know, science, science probably isn't missing out on it. Um, the ideal is go find two or three or 20 or a hundred, right. And then keep one or two or 50 of them and, and donate a piece of one and then sell off some of it. I know, I know treasure hunters. There's a group of us that uh, will never, ever sell anything. We have every, (laughs) 
every pull tab, every nail that has been dug up, it is in a Riker box out in our garage, right? <laughs> um, and some people are that way. Okay, that's fine. You know, I, I mean, it's a little, I, I, I'm not super flip. I, I don't really mean, I, I mean, it, you probably should get it to science. Um, I, I, no one's going to die because you you hoarded your rock and you didn't give it to science. But it's, it's, it's a nice, noble thing to do. We've got this great relationship, unlike a lot of other other field of treasure hunting, right, where academia uh, is at odds and at war with, you know, artifact hunters, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever, you know, because – there's a context that has information. And, and then some of the academia, they just have this stupid idea that they're God and, they, and the, the common folk shouldn't have any of this stuff, right? Uh, like as if they get off their chair and go out and hunt themselves, right? So uh, in, in our world, we're really fortunate. We, we have this tradition that um, there's a couple researchers that have that attitude, but very, they're old and dying off. Um, and pretty much everybody, and uh, they love it. Uh, the researchers love it that there's guys out there finding stuff, and it's win-win. It's not like, like you would never take a, a, a I don't know, 1864 $10 gold piece and, and cut it in half and donate mm, 20% oh. to the museum, <laughs> right? So, but, or, or you wouldn't, you know, do a, take a Van Gogh and cut 20% off and donate it. You know, with meteorites, Yes, we to get, you got to get inside them to get the information, and every once in a while you'll get one that is just so aesthetically beautiful that you really probably should not cut it. It would be a crime, a moral crime to cut it. And in that case, hope, go find a second one and donate, you know, a piece of the ugly one or whatever. <laughs> you know, and um, but uh, it's it's a it's a personal it's a personal decision if someone wants to to do that. Or or not? Yes, I seen on uh, one of your shows you're talking about everybody buying yellow shirts. So, what is the significance of the neon shirts, and why should others wear them while searching for meteorites? Well, it's a little more of the um, kind of the team spirit on it. I I acquired that shirt um, for a meteorite hunt in Chile a year and a half ago, and um, uh, I wanted to be seen a mile away. And bad gummit, it works. Mm-hmm. I can literally be seen a mile away in that shirt in the desert. And so, um, also when you run a ghost tour, um, uh, car lights hit the uh, bright yellow, and they see you as well. So that it's become uh, my my um, dual um, career uniform. Um, now, I mean, some people want to be sneaky and some people want to trespass on private property and some people don't want anyone to know who they are or that they're out hunting. Cause you know, if they're on, if they're, if they're on, on the hunt, they don't want to draw attention. I, on the other hand, I'm starving for attention. I want people to go, wow, that's a bright shirt. And they give me attention and, and it, it emotionally, no, not really. Um, I, I, my mode I'm in right now is I want to train thousands of people to go out and find meteorite. And I, I want to do that with my YouTube series, but I also want to do it face to face and in person and encourage people. So if I am out and I am wearing that shirt and if someone saw me on YouTube and uh, cause a fireball went over you know, two days before and they're out looking and they see me, I want that. I want them to see me a half a mile away or a block away and go, Oh, there's Steve and come find me. Cause I, I'm, I want, I'm in this, let's give information, let's give this away. And I want to help people. And so I want to be found. And so if I'm hunting, I want to be found. And part of that, uh, the inc- and, and it's, it's, it'll, it'll wrap up a little more as we get in, uh, as we get the, 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 next few episodes um up online it'll it'll wrap up the more of the why behind that but the idea is that if you've been through our learning curve if you've gone through that hour crash course uh, a, a meteorite lands over uh, indianapolis right and i reach out to the local media and i say hey um this is breaking news obviously if you need help if you need an uh actually correct information for your stories you're going to publish um i'm here 
you know. And in exchange, uh, my authority, because I've been on TV, not that, you know, that necessarily makes me smarter, but there, there's some credibility with that. Um, and that I have this online free course for anybody that wants to go mm-hmm. find a piece, you know, you learn, learn what you need in an hour and then go, go find me. If you've gone through that, then if you wear yellow, it's, you're, it's like the team colors. It's just, if someone else sees you or you see someone else out there hunting with yellow on, you're going to go, oh, dude, they're one of us. They're looking for mm-hmm. rocks, too. You know, and you can go over and say, hey, did you find anything? What have you heard? You know, well, they found something over there on the football field, and we're looking over here on the baseball field. It's like, oh, wow, someone found one over there? Okay. It, you know, this is all about information, and yeah, Sometimes people want to, and I, I'm. There's times when I don't want to give out information because it's, you know, hard earned. And and if you get if you got rocks out there worth five thousand bucks, you know, if you really want to just tell everybody, well, I'm kind of dumb right now. I'm wanting to tell everybody because um, I have a, a broader plan here. I want to train people all over, predominantly the United States, but you know, it's the internet, so it's, it'll, it'll go around the world. I want to get people trained all over the place, so every time there's a fireball, there is a group of already trained people. It's real easy for people to see a fireball. Oh, I want to find a piece. Well, okay, great. Now take the hour and learn and go, go find a piece. Mm-hmm. But a year later, when one lands an hour away, maybe they didn't see about it, but they're, they or they see another one, or their friends tell them, oh, my God, it exploded, and there were the sonic booms, and what? A fireball? And <laughs> you, you learn what you learned a, a year ago. Now you'll show up. You'll, you'll drive over there. And the idea is over time is to have more people, because the more people that are trained and they know what to look for, I can't be everywhere, especially, you know, like now. <laughs> Literally right. cannot be anywhere. Um but guess what? Fireball dropped something over Indianapolis. Hey, you know, and even if even if all of India is locked down, I don't think it is now. But even if it was, there's still, you know, there's a farmer out there checking his cows, right? If there's rocks on his ground, he needs to know what to look for. And you, mm-hmm. know, you can still be on lockdown and still, you know, the, the cop driving around or the ambulance driver driving around and sees a black rock on the road because of the fireball the night before, you know, right. if he knows what to look for, he can stop, pick it up. So the idea is to educate and train people, um, you know, the same, same reason anybody else, the same reason you do what you're doing, right? Oh my God, you're giving away secrets, yeah. you know? Oh yeah. That's yeah. kind of what we do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I got to tell you, Steve, this has been one of the more fascinating conversations I've had in a while. Um, thank you so much. You fill our heads with so much knowledge. And I, I know a lot of our listeners are going to want to take their metal detectors and, and go over to your website, uh, your YouTube channel and, and learn and go out and find some rocks. Um, and we'd love to have you on for another time because there's so much more we could talk about, like the haunted tours. Um, you've dabbled in magic and you're, you know, what it was like to be on a TV show show. So um, we'd love to save that for another show um, and, and have you back. And I would just urge all our listeners, you know, visit meteoritemen.com. Um, join St- Steve's Facebook page at facebook.com slash meteoritemen. Of course, go to his YouTube channel. Um, I've watched all the videos he's got so far. They're very informative and, and they'll get your uh, your creative juices flowing on where you can hunt next. So just go to YouTube and search for Fireball Steve. Um, anything else you'd like our listeners to know, Steve? Yeah, you know, what What would be the coolest thing in the world is somewhere, sometime, like in the next year, there'll be a fireball. There'll be several. But if there's a fireball that flies over one of you, someone listening to this right now, flies over, they remember this, whether they made it to my, you, uh, hopefully everyone goes to YouTube and likes it and subscribes there. But but if they haven't, that, the, the, you're not going to forget where to go to get the information, right? Just search on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And and, and then one of your listeners finds a rock and then you then let's get you and me and them on a call for a follow-up because that's where it's going to be fun um is is that and and it, and it will happen i'm 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 convinced maybe, maybe not in a year maybe it'll take two years or so but say, someone's going to come back and go hey or 
it, someone took my advice and, and uh, decided, well, let's research meteorites near me. And, mm. um, and, and they go out and, and find, you know, maybe the 38th meteorite from one, you know, mm-hmm. particular fall, uh, you know, maybe landed 5,000 years ago, but they're out there and, you know, and, and, and I mean, if it's, if, if you're on the, uh, uh, um, you know, in an area where you're going to metal detect anyway, you know, why not, why not hunt, um, why not hunt for bottles or for, um, uh, uh, coins or whatever inside a stream field where there's, uh, where there's meteorites. You got to, yeah, a lot of gold hunters do that. Um, you know, hunt for, they'll hunt for gold and me- and meteorites at the same spot. So mm-hmm. but definitely, uh, it, it adds a, adds, adds a fun, fun flavor to it. Get a good rare earth magnet that helps a lot. And, and of course that's all in the series. You'll, you'll learn everything. I've enjoyed this. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, there's some other topics we can we can delve into when you run out of other interesting things to talk to other people about. Uh, get a hold of me. And we'll come back and do this again. Oh, this, is, this is very interesting, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners really enjoy listening to it. But we are out of time, so we would love to have you back, and we will talk to you more about some other details. Yeah. 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 Again, thanks, thanks so much, Steve. I really, really appreciate it. All right. All right. We'll see you. You bet. Check us out online at xpteamusa.com. If you are in the market for a new pinpointer, then check out XP's MI6 pinpointer. Waterproof up to 6 meters, 2 audio modes, pitch or poles, 3 levels of sensitivity, rechargeable lithium battery, 7 programs to choose from, 7th program being connectivity to your machine, allowing 50 levels of sensitivity and recovery mode for your MI6. For those on a budget, check out the MI4 pinpointer with all the same options except for connectivity. So find an MI6 or an MI4 pinpointer through a dealer near you all right we're back and that was really great talking with steve arnold I learned a lot i really want to get out and look for some meteorites i do too and when he was telling me that you know uh there's there's probably some around within a mile of you i kind of want to get up there and search all over the place but uh that's probably not the right approach oh yeah same here i went to talk to him a little bit after and i was told him about uh there's a lake nearby and i went there and i was talking to the ranger about metal detecting and he mentioned a guy would go out there in his kayak and do magnet fishing looking for meteorites and and i told him about it and he said that's probably not a good idea because you don't think that a whole lot of the meteorites will stick to the magnet so that's mm-hmm. interesting. well apparently they do even the ones with a little bit of a only a little bit of metal content if you got a really strong rare earth magnet it's possible hey yeah you never know you probably find some other cool stuff doing it yeah right yeah he said that some of them are magnetized but not all of them no mm-hmm. right but I, I would look at it and just think it's a rock. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's that's the thing. How would most likely I'd find something and take it somewhere in LA. Oh, that's just a piece of junk. Yeah. It'd be like exactly. that Joe Dirt. I've, I've been yeah, I've been there with uh oh, this is a Native American artifact. I'm like, no, it's a it's a rock. Yeah. A piece of iron that came off a boat. Right. Yeah. right. It'd be like a Joe so. Dirt. That peanut there is a dead giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. So uh, well, go on our Facebook page, check us out, check out our, our YouTube channel. Yeah, search for XP Team USA on YouTube. Um, the ORX contest is uh, tomorrow night, which is May 16th, I believe. Is that the right date yeah. for Saturday? Yeah. Yep. Yes, it is. And yeah, and uh, if you haven't already, stop by uh, Josh Kimmel's show, Beyond Sight and Sound, every Sunday and Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. It's a great show. Yes, go there, listen to his show, comment on his message board, and let him know that you're there. Also, like his show, follow his show, all that. Give him much love. He's a very interesting guy, and it's it's a great show. Yeah, definitely check him out. And our next show will be Friday night, May 29th. So uh, please come back and listen to us again. All right. We'll, we'll see you. Take care. Get that permission. Put the coil to the soil, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Metal Detecting Podcast. Brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. <laughs>